Ladies and gentlemen, please stand and join us for welcoming Bob McDonald. Thank you, good morning. Hi, I'm Bob. Anybody here from Team PB&J? Let's, come on, let's hear it. Team PB&J. For those of you who don't know what Team PB&J is, um, listen to some of the people screaming and ask them afterward. We had a lot of fun when we were together in Dallas. Thanks uh, to Aaron and Jessica for that kind introduction. Thank you to all of you. I want to thank you for your service. I want to thank you for your sacrifices, your courage, and your perseverance. You are why we're here today. In fact, I'll take that a step further and say that we wouldn't be here today if it weren't for you and the service that you provided our country. SVA has been around for 10 years now, from a grassroots group of veterans who got it started to now over 1,500 chapters supporting a million student veterans. That's fantastic progress, and I can see it continue to grow. Some may be inclined to say that's unbelievable, but I would actually say it's completely believable because I've seen what service members and veterans can do. It's that commitment, that compassionate leadership, and that purpose to do noble things. You know, the original GI Bill was empowered by the greatest generation. They shaped our nation after World War II. But thanks in large part to SVA, the post 9-11 GI Bill is now the forever GI Bill, empowering you. And I hope you got to see the display down in the campus with the signing pens and, and all of that. Uh, it's really quite something. Because this empowers you to shape your education to reach your goals. And that's really what it's all about. So now, it's your turn. And those of you who were here three years ago may remember uh, Vice President Biden, who at that time challenged us as veterans to be leaders of our nation. It's our turn. It's our turn individually, each one of us. But it's our turn as a group, collectively. It's your role and responsibility to shape the future of our country. Are you up to it? Are you up to it? Are you up to it? One of you will be the Secretary of Veterans Affairs someday. One of you will be the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of the Procter & Gamble Company. It's all up to you. It's now your turn. Have you defined your purpose so that you can define your future? Those two go together. Define your purpose and define your future. Well, let's see. Imagine for me that you're here in San Antonio in a hospital. You're about to pass away. You're in your hospital bed. And those who you love are surrounding you. And they say to you, have you accomplished your purpose in life? What would you say? It's your turn. You have to have a purpose. You have to have a goal. You have to have a mission. Because you're going somewhere, and it's better to have a purpose and head to that purpose rather than meander through life without direction. Now, Jared sent out my principles of leadership over social media, hashtag NotCon2018. If you miss them, I'm sure he'll get you straight on them. But the first and the most important one is living a life driven by a purpose leads to a more meaningful life than meandering through life without direction. You're going somewhere. Wouldn't it be better to head toward a purpose? Let me explain my life's purpose my guiding star, my purpose and principles that have navigated me through my life. Interestingly, the purpose doesn't change. The principles don't change. But depending upon the context, 
the behaviors sometimes change as we go through life's transitions. I thought what I'd do is I'd share with you some of the things I've learned from my life's transitions. Since many of you are in transition now, or after you graduate, will be in transition. Cultures are where we serve change. So we have to adapt our behavior sometimes, depending upon the culture. But I'll talk about the constancy of purpose and principles through my life's transitions. And I'll talk about four transitions, from high school to West Point, from West Point to the Army, from the Army to Procter & Gamble, from Procter & Gamble to becoming the Secretary of the Department of Veterans Affairs. Let's start first with high school to West Point. I've always been kind of a purposeful individual, so I first applied to West Point when I was in sixth grade, 11 years old. No, I didn't get in. Fortunately, my congressman, Donald Rumsfeld at the time, encouraged me to continue applying every year until I was really eligible to go. But I've always had that kind of sense of purpose, being early and being ready and planning ahead. Well, that didn't necessarily serve me well my first day at West Point. I was supposed to be at Mikey Stadium. I think it opened up about 7 o'clock. So I wanted to be the first one in line in my class. That day, that our day, they call it, reorganization day, uh, you show up, you get measured for your uniforms, you learn how to march, you learn how to salute. By the end of the day, you're marching to Trophy Point and taking the oath uh, to the Constitution as you become on active duty in the United States Army. So because I was the first in line, because I was early, I finished all of those tasks before the rest of my classmates. I got to my room, I had all my clothes that had been measured and tailored for me. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna get a step ahead and I'm gonna put all of these things away in a very neat, organized way. Well, we marched out to Trophy Point to get sworn in. And by the time I got back to the room, all of my clothes, all of my gear, all of my books, everything, were stacked in the middle of the room. And my squad leader was there to say, McDonald, you toolbox, don't you know we have a way to fold our underwear at West Point and a special place to put it? So early is not always good, unless early means you're right. And I, of course, didn't have the manual to do that. The other thing I learned at West Point was about leadership. Uh, when I was a first class cadet, a senior, I was a brigade adjutant, a leadership position in the Corps of Cadets. But in that leadership position, even though I had authority over the cadets and the Corps of Cadets, I learned that peer leadership is a different kind of leadership. It's, an, it's, a, it's a leadership that requires uh, unusual effectiveness because you know as a leader, you never want to use your authority to get something done. When you use your authority, you've lost. The other thing I learned is that you always have to take time to help people. Uh, when it was okay with the honor code, uh, I was a generally a pretty good student, so I would typically do my homework and tape it on my door so anyone who had questions on how to do the problems could come in and get some help. So again, this experience, this transition, was about changing behavior but preserving those bedrock purpose and principles. Second transition, West Point to the Army. Well, my transition to the Army was difficult. I had to fire my first platoon sergeant. I was a second lieutenant, fresh out of West Point, butter bar as they called us. My platoon sergeant was a two-tour Vietnam veteran. But on a day when we were supposed to test an experimental parachute, he chose not to jump out of the airplane. He was the jump master, so none of us knew he didn't jump, but he landed with the airplane. My soldiers were a little skeptical because they thought that he was afraid to jump. Uh, I got wind of this, so I had to confront him. And he lied to me, he said he jumped, but I had photographic film, because it was a testing a new parachute, that said he didn't jump, I had to fire him. You have to preserve those principles, integrity is one of those principles. Another vignette about my experience in the Army was I had, was an infantry officer, in those days, there was no internet, but I did the advanced course for infantry officers by correspondence. I would mail in Holland cards, uh, these little punch cards, 
uh, to Fort Benning, and they would grade me, and I graduated from infantry officer uh, advanced course by correspondence. So I went to branch, and I said, look, it, uh, I'd like to be kind of a different infantry officer. I want to be light infantry. I'm airborne. I'm ranger. Jungle warfare, Arctic warfare, desert warfare expert, been to all those schools, graduated. So I'd like to go to the Marine Corps advanced course rather than going to the infantry advanced course. And the officer said, well, we don't do that. And I said, well, I know you don't do that, but that's why I'm here. I'm here in advance of you issuing orders so you can figure out how to do it because I'd like to go to the Marine Corps advanced course. Well, what I later got off uh, orders to the Armor Advanced Course. In fact, what I told the guy at the time was, whatever you do, don't send me to the Armor Advanced Course. <laughs> I studied thermodynamics at West Point, but that doesn't mean I'm good in the motor pool. And guess what? I got orders of the Armor Advanced Course. So I said to the assignment officer, I said, I don't understand this. I said, I want the Marine Corps Advanced Course. He said, yeah, we don't do that. And I said, I know. That's why I gave you warning. I wanted to do that. And I said, I didn't want to go to the Armor Advanced Course, and you sent me orders of the Armor Advanced Course. And he said, well, I, I knew I had written down Armor Advanced Course, but I thought I'd written that down because you wanted it. So I knew that the Army wasn't necessarily the place where I was going to reach my full potential. Lessons. There are a lot of lessons. You know, from being a top cadet at West Point to being a second lieutenant in the Army, you start over again. Don't be afraid of starting over again in your transitions. Oftentimes, you have to start over again to get to that purpose, to get to where you want to be. Whatever the endeavor, immerse yourself. Do the infantry officer advanced course by correspondence. Get your MBA like I did at night and on the weekends. Immerse yourself. Be the best you can be. Third transition, from the Army to Procter & Gamble. The purpose was the guiding thing. When I went to look for a company to join, the questions I asked were about purpose, about purpose, about values, about principles, and about the people that you meet. If you go to look for a career, I suggest you look at those things. Don't look at title. Don't look at money. Don't look at location. Purpose, values, and people. Well, I had a rude awakening my first day at Procter & Gamble. I walked into Procter & Gamble, and my boss who was 22 years old, I was 25, 26, 27. Um, he, he, you know, and his claim to fame was being president of a, of a 10 member fraternity. Um, showed me my desk and I said, well, where is the manual that tells you how to organize the files in your desk? And of course he laughed. He said, we don't have those kind of manuals at Procter and Gamble and everybody organizes their desk the way they want to be. I had to learn to operate in a new culture. Then the company, in its wisdom over my 33 years, decided to send me abroad. I went to Toronto, I went to Manila. These are places I lived with my family. Japan for six years, Brussels for three years. In each case, you have to learn to lead in a new culture. You don't change your purpose, you don't change your principles, but you do have to change the way you behave. For example, if you go to a global meeting and you have Japanese people or Asian people in the room, if you as the leader don't make room for them to comment, they won't comment because they come from a Confucian culture where they're very uh, knowledgeable, they're very respectful of hierarchy, and they will not comment. The Americans and the Europeans will all be arguing with each other, and there won't be room for the Asians to comment. You as the leader have to make room for that. You have to know the culture. You have to adapt to the culture and learn the right way. You have to change your behavior, preserve your principles, but change your behavior. And as always, you have to take time to help people because just like we learned at West Point, if you want to graduate, you have to cooperate. Fourth transition, P&G to VA. Purpose was operating here. Obviously, when President Obama asked me to lead the VA, it was a time of crisis, but my purpose was out there. My purpose is to help improve the lives of others. So obviously, this was a good fit. The mission at the VA wasn't about adapting to the culture, though. It was about changing the culture. What I found at the VA was a very rules-based culture. What do I mean by that? Well, VA is very rules-based because it's a very large organization. Large organizations tend to run by rules. Congress passes laws, those laws result in rules. 
agencies, government agencies write rules, but rules get in the way. You know, I, I, I talk often about that time when a uh, disabled veteran came to our clinic in Washington State, and uh, he, he was uh, uh, disabled, so he was unable to get into the clinic. He called our receptionist and he said, would you please come out and help me get into the clinic? And our receptionist said, well, I, I can't do that. We have a rule that I can't leave my desk, and we have a rule that I can't help move someone who is injured. Well, that was the wrong response, because any good customer service organization is not going to be rules-based. It's going to be principles-based. It's going to say, well, gee, is that the way you want to be treated? Is that the way you would treat your mother or your father? So we had to change the VA from a rules-based organization to a principles-based organization. That principle-based organization uh, is uh, best represented by another example, which happened later after we had had this discussion about rules versus principles. In Ver White River Junction, Vermont, a veteran didn't show up for their mental health care appointment. Not unusual, 25, 30% of mental health care patients don't show up. Uh, but this nurse thought this was unusual. Make a long story short, she got the VA police, the local police, they broke into his house, found he had fallen wedged between two pieces of furniture and was on his way to death, and she saved his life. That's applying the principle, not the rule. Now, in, in a, a principle-based organization, the leader has to have the backs of the employees in that organization because if they had broken that door down and discovered he was sitting there drinking a cup of coffee, I as the leader would have to protect that employee from being punished for making the wrong decision. But in a, in a principle-based organization, if you're going to satisfy customers, you have to give employees the ability to make those decisions and take initiative. Leading a VA was about breaking down the culture, the tyranny of the rule, as we called it. So here are some lessons. Each transition tests your purpose and principles. Purpose is the guiding star. Authority-centric leaders fail people and organizations. Rules-based cultures fail people and organizations. You get what you design. Organizations are perfectly designed to deliver the results they deliver. So overarching lessons are, from my life, is each transition tests purpose and principles. Each transition, don't be afraid to start at the bottom, at a deficit, and work your way back up as long as you're focused on purpose. Each transition, you adapt behaviors, not principles. Each transition, you modify execution, but not principles. And each transition expands opportunities. Here's my advice to you. Life is a series of experiences. Live each day with a purpose. Seek experiences based on principle. You know, if I hadn't have been the chairman of the U.S.-China Business Council as the CEO of the Procter & Gamble Company, I would not have gotten to know President Obama and probably would not have been in consideration for uh, Secretary of VA. Each one of these experiences in life layers on itself, and you never know where they can lead. Make career decisions based on your purpose, not a title, not income, not status. It's why I introduce myself as, hi, I'm Bob. My purpose is why I joined Procter & Gamble. My purpose is why I didn't hesitate to serve as the VA secretary. My purpose is why I joined Partnership for Public Service. It's about helping improve how our federal government operates on a day-to-day -day basis and serves all Americans. And my purpose is why, when asked, I chose to join Dave Gowell at Rally Point. How many of you are members of Rally Point? If you're not, go to Rally Point and consider becoming a member, www.rallypoint.com. It's a great online virtual community for joining with other members of the military and the military community. 
It's where you can get information and services that you can't otherwise get. And it's where you can find resources that you might not be aware of. And my purpose is why when Jared asked me to come here today to speak, that I jumped at the chance. Because any time I can help any of you, please don't hesitate to let me know. My email address is ramwp75 at gmail.com. If I can ever help, contact me, and I will be there to try to help you. Don't fear starting over. Career transitions are about starting over. Have confidence. You should have confidence. You all did great things in the military. You served your country admirably. You're off to a great start, and there's greatness in your future. That confidence, coupled with your ability to start over and to transition and to build on your military service and your education, is going to lead our nation forward. So in closing, define your purpose, define your future, and thanks for sharing some of your time with me. If I can help, please don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you very much.